Hello, everyone. Hello. There we go. It is my honor to introduce the Reverend Alexia Salvatierra. The Reverend Salvatierra is the author with Dr. Peter Hetzel of Faith Rooted Organizing, Mobilizing the Church in Service to the World, and the founder of the Faith Rooted Organizing Network. She is an ordained Lutheran pastor with over 35 years of experience in congregational and community ministry, including church-based service and community development programs, congregational and community organizing, and legislative advocacy. Reverend Salvatierra was formerly the, the director of justice for the Southwest California Synod of the ELCA, in addition to coordinating the welcoming congregations and guardian angels network for the Southwest California Synod, and assisting at Hope Lutheran Church. She served as a consultant, training, facilitating, organizing, and leading strategic planning for a variety of national and international organizations, including World Vision, Interbar City Christian Fellowship, and the Christian Community Development Association. She has been a national leader in the areas of working poverty and immigration for over 20 years, including the co-founding of the National Evangelical Immigration Table and the 2007 New Century Movement. Reverend Salvatierra also serves as adjunct uh, faculty at multiple seminaries. Please welcome our Reverend Salvatierra. So I have a 23-year-old daughter who is the light of my life. And when she was in high school, she used to bring her friends over quite a bit. And one of her friends who came over had no religious background at all. She said, I'm interested in this Jesus, but only if he transforms the world. <laughs> and that really struck me for a couple of reasons. One is because I became a Christian at that same age. I was also raised in a family with no religious background. My family is from Mexico and from Russia, but they were from the anti-church traditions in both countries. And I became a Christian in the Jesus movement of the 70s. I am that old. <laughs> and I was not introduced to a Jesus who transforms the world. I was introduced to a Jesus who saves our souls for heaven. Thanks be to God. But it was over the years that I realized that Jesus does even more than that, over the years that I became Lutheran. I realized that we do have a Jesus who transforms the whole person in the whole family, in the whole neighborhood, in the whole community, in the whole world. So the longing of this child for transformation, which I think is very characteristic of her generation and generations to follow as well, that this longing can be satisfied. The question is, what does it mean to say that we have a Jesus who transforms the world? What can we actually offer this child? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. This scripture is a beautiful vision of abundant life. I normally don't like the message translation, but I love it in this particular scripture, and I want to read it out loud. Pay close attention now. I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I am creating. I'll create Jerusalem as sheer joy, create my people as pure delight. I'll take joy in Jerusalem, take delight in my people. No more sounds of weeping in the city, no cries of anguish, no more babies dying in the cradle, or old people who don't enjoy a full lifetime. One hundredth birthdays will be considered normal Anything less will seem like a cheat. 
They'll build houses and move in. They'll plant fields and eat what they grow. No more building a house that some outsider takes over. No more planting fields that some enemy confiscates. For my people will be as long lived as trees. My chosen ones will have satisfaction in their work. They won't work and have nothing come of it. They won't have children snatched out from under them. For they themselves are plantings blessed by God. With their children and grandchildren, likewise God blessed. Before they call out, I'll answer. Before they sp finish speaking, I'll have heard. This is the word of the Lord. So, of course, this is not, this beautiful vision is not going to come true in every way until Christ comes back. We can't bring the kingdom in fullness, but we can move towards the kingdom as we do the will of the king. And as we do that, we begin to experience foretastes of the feast to come. So how do we move towards this vision of abundant life? I want to suggest that Micah 6.8 offers us a set of strategies for moving towards this vision. What does the Lord God require of us but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God? Now, I want to celebrate that the Lutheran Church is not bad at loving mercy. We're far from perfect, but there are people around the world and throughout the centuries who have felt the love of God coming through Lutherans. Hallelujah. Now, walking humbly, sometimes. <laughs> but doing justice confuses our people. We often don't have a very clear vision of biblical justice and of what it can and should look like in our communities. And the way that the world does justice often gives us spiritual indigestion. But it's not unimportant. There are over a thousand verses in the Old and New Testaments that use one of the four words for justice. So if we look at the tools that we are given to move towards that vision of abundant life, we can't ignore that tool. So I'm going to try to unpack it a little. The world sees justice and mercy as two very different things, in tension, maybe even in conflict. But biblically, justice and mercy kiss. I believe that if we follow mercy all the way, if our mercy is as broad and deep as we are called to make it, that it will take us all the way over to justice. And I'd like to take you on that journey in a way that you can also use with your congregations. So I want to start by asking you a question. When you look out into the world, do you see anything that breaks your heart? And I'm not talking about the heartbreak that is inevitable. A good friend of mine the other day lost her 93-year-old father. That broke her heart, but no one was surprised. I'm talking about what Father Gustavo Gutierrez of Peru talked about when he said, injustice, extreme poverty, means dying before your time, dying unnecessarily and unjustly. So a number of years ago, I was a hospital chaplain in the Philippines. I was a chaplain at two hospitals about a mile apart from each other. One was the National Children's Hospital that served the children of the poorest families. The other was a middle-class Episcopal hospital. One day I was at the NCH, and one of the doctors said to me, Pastor, I need you to come with me to break the news to a family that their toddler is probably going to die. I said, Doctor, this doesn't make any sense. I've seen that baby's chart. He has pneumonia. We can cure pneumonia with antibiotics. The doctor said, Yes, Pastor, but this baby is allergic to penicillin. And penicillin is the only antibiotic that we have at the National Children's Hospital. I knew that one mile away at the Episcopal Hospital, we had 20 antibiotics. I knew that if this baby died, he died unnecessarily and unjustly. When you look out into the world, what kind of unnecessary and unjust suffering do you see that breaks your heart? 
And I just want you to turn to the person next to you and just share the first thing that came up. So this is just very quick. Just take a minute to do that. So I'm going to call you back together. And I'm just going to share with you something that is currently breaking my heart. Our synod is a companion synod with the Lutheran Church of El Salvador, which I think many of you may be acquainted with that church. They were a Missouri synod plant originally, so they're sort of pan-Lutheran in their essence. If you go for a short-term mission trip to the Lutheran Church of El Salvador, you may stay in the guest home run by that very sweet little grandmother in front named Trinidad. That's her family behind her who help her run the guest home. The boy on your right is one of her grandchildren, Jose. Well, Jose was in high school one day, and he got approached by two members of the Mara Salvatrucha who said to him, we want you to join. The Mara Salvatrucha is referred to in the papers as a gang, but I think a gang is a misnomer. It's one of the most powerful international mafias that's ever existed. It makes its money through gun trafficking, drug trafficking, and human trafficking, and extortion of small businesses. And they are taking over increasingly large territories of Central America. So Jose did not want to join the Mara Salvatrucha. And so he thought, my father will help me. My father is a strong man, physically and spiritually, a bus driver. So right after school, he ran home. And his, uh, the Mara followed him, the two kids who had asked him to join or told him to join. They ran after him, and he got to the house. And sure enough, his father had just gotten home. That's his father on your left. And his father came out and said to the kids who were in hot pursuit, you can't have my son. Whereupon one of them drew out a pistol and shot him dead in the street. The next day, Jose ran for family in the United States. He's one of about 80,000 kids that have run from the Northern Triangle of Central America in the last two years. When they get to this country, if they can get a lawyer, about 80% of them receive political asylum which is essentially the same criteria as refugee status. If they don't have a lawyer, about 7% receive political asylum. So a lawyer is the difference between life and death for these kids. I carry that. It breaks my heart. So now I want us to get in touch with our respective heartbreak, and let's Let's take it somewhere. Let's take it on a journey. If we were all to share what breaks our hearts, as I just did, and we were to listen to each other, little by little, our hearts would be on the floor. It would be so much bad news. The average person runs away from so much bad news. The only way that people can actually stay in there long enough to respond to the bad news of our world, to that which breaks our hearts, is if they have good news that is as powerful as the bad news. And we do have good news. If the heart of the creator and sustainer of the universe is also broken by that which breaks our hearts, then there's hope. Amen? amen. I preach in Pentecostal context all the time, so you have to get used to the amen. <laughs> Just what we do. One of my favorite scriptures. Matthew 9, 35 and 36. Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion. Compassion is not pity. Compassion is an English word or Spanish word consisting of two Latin words, com and pasio. Pasio means feel or suffer and com means with. Jesus looks at us and he feels our pain as if it was his pain. He feels our hopes and dreams as if they were his hopes and dreams. And that's what moved him on a human level to do all that he did. But Jesus did something in the scripture before he had compassion. And for the people in our congregations to experience the breadth and depth and fullness of Christ's compassion, they have to do, we have to do, what he did first. What did he do? He looked. 
He looked deep into the hearts of people and he saw what was hurting them. He looked deep into their lives and he saw what they were longing for. We don't really have a compassion problem in our church, but sometimes we have a vision problem. We don't see clearly what is happening even with the people in the pews, let alone with the people in our communities. So I want you to think for a minute about that which breaks your heart, and I want you to think of one person who is affected by that. Can you think of that person? Maybe someone you know, maybe someone you've just heard of. And hold that person in our heart, and we're really going to try to see them clearly through Jesus' eyes and see where that takes us. So the first step is that you're seeing them at all. Because for many of us, much of the time, those people are invisible. But no one is invisible in Jesus' eyes. He makes visible. So that's the first step, is just to see. But if you see that person only in terms of their need, they're not fully visible. Hebrews 13.2 says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, because by doing so you may entertain who? Angels. Now, in Koine Greek, angel does not just refer to celestial beings with wings, right? It refers to any messenger of God sent to bring a blessing. If we see the people who are suffering from that which breaks our hearts, clearly we will see that they're not only people who need something from us, but maybe they're people who are bringing us something. Maybe they're people who are bringing us a message from God or a blessing, and that changes our willingness to connect with them. So to see them through Jesus' eyes is to not only see the need, but also to see the potential blessing. But let's go another step deeper. If we take Ephesians seriously, we only have one heavenly father. What does that make us to one another? Brothers and sisters. I said I'm half Latina. For us, brothers and sisters is heavy. I may not like my brother and my sister. I confess I have a sister I don't particularly like. But I'm still responsible to her and for her. I am my sister's keeper. How does it shift you to see that person you're holding in your heart and mind as your actual brother or sister? And I'm going to go even one step deeper than that. If that person is a believer, that's not just your brother or your sister. That's your arm. We are the body of Christ. Why don't we feel the pain in our arms? Well, what is the disease where you don't feel the pain in your fingers, in your toes, in your nose? Well, the old leprosy. I believe that Jesus' healings were both real and symbolic. I believe that he opened the eyes of the blind, but I believe that he did it to also show us that he's the light of the world. Why do you think he healed so many lepers? Because his body is prone to leprosy. We will never be fully alive as the body of Christ unless we recognize our full connection. So what does it mean to see that person as someone whose happiness is essential to your own? Feel how this begins to shift us? And I want to take you even one step farther. We're getting into the depth and the breadth of the mercy that we're called to. It doesn't just say that Jesus saw individuals. It says that he saw the crowd. The truth is that we see the problem and the solution differently if we only see individuals or we also see the crowd. If we see one little child struggling in school and you have compassion for that child, what do you do for that child? Anyone? You tutor them, right? But if you see 300 children struggling in the same school, you say, what is wrong with that school? Why aren't the teachers teaching? Do they not have books? You have just crossed the line here from mercy to justice, just by following mercy all the way. And then I'm going to take us even one step farther on this journey. When Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion, what did he give? It's a little bit of a trick question. He gave everything. He gave his life. He gave everything he had to give. The question, my brothers and sisters, is not what are we required to give to respond to a world that breaks our hearts. 
It's what do we have in our hands? What are the tools? That's stewardship. What are the tools that we have to use? And I want to suggest that we have a much wider variety of tools than we typically use in our churches. So it's typical when we see a hungry person to give them a fish. That's natural, and sometimes that's absolutely the best tool for the job, right? Because if you're hungry, you don't want to wait to learn to fish. But part of what it means to use everything we've been given is that it's not enough to love with your heart. You have to love with your mind as well. You have to love as intelligently and as effectively as you can. And so while it might be love to give them a fish, it might be more intelligent and effective too. Everyone knows this. Teach them to fish. Well, what does that mean? Usually that means individual development. So I'll, I go beyond just doing something for people, and I begin to call something out of them. I want to help them do something for themselves. So I don't just give them a fish. I might do job training. And, I, and that might be a more effective way to help them. But what happens when some people in a community get job training and they get up and out? Is the community any better off? Sometimes it's worse off. And so sometimes what you have to do is you have to fish together. You have to involve people in working together to actually make a difference for the whole community. That's community development. And churches can do that as well. We have in our hands that capacity. But then sometimes you take your fishing pole down to the pond, even if there's a group of you with poles, and there's a wall around the pond. <laughs> then you have to take down the wall to get to the pond. It's the same love. It's the same love that caused you to give a fish, to teach an individual to fish, to fish together, and to take down the walls. When I was talking earlier about Jose, we have a program called the Guardian Angels. We accompany these kids in court the best we can. We love them. We pray for them. We try desperately to find them lawyers, but lawyers are not cheap. <laughs> There's a lot of kids and not very many lawyers. We have to begin to look at the policy that provides lawyers or doesn't provide lawyers, how we use our foreign assistance, what is, what is happening to try to solve the problem at the roots. All of these are questions that we can ask, and therefore, we should. The walls in our communities are put up or taken down by what we call public decisions. If I make a private decision, it affects my family, my little church, my block, my small business. But there are people that make public decisions that affect all of us. A democracy is a system where we all have a say in the public decisions that are made. When I was a young radical, which I'm sure surprises you that I was a young radical, I didn't think we had a democracy in this country. I didn't think that the average person could have a say in public decision making. And then I was in the Philippines under the dictator Ferdinand Marcos, and I went, we do have a democracy. <laughs> Thanks be to God. But we don't use the gifts that we're given. We don't use the tools of democracy. And I've become aware, um, I was actually in Wisconsin earlier this week with the Bishop's Conference of the St. Paul Synod. And I went, oh my goodness, do Lutherans have a public footprint or what in this part of the world? If you all got together, think about what you could achieve. Think about what kinds of healthy and life-giving public decisions could be made, sometimes across all the partisan lines. Just wanted to have you begin to think imaginatively and creatively about what stewardship could mean for you. So let me just uh, give you this little chart. But actually, even before the chart, I want to tell you a very brief story. Um, I was running a homeless drop-in center, and it was Christmas Eve. And a family came in, a father, a mother, two little babies, and they had nowhere to stay. So I called every homeless shelter I could possibly think of, and there was no room at the inn. And I called my roommates, who I was not getting along very well with at the time. I was young. And they said, no more homeless families coming home with you. So you can tell why we weren't getting along. 
And I said, it's Christmas Eve. And they said, exactly. <laughs> However, I have read Matthew 25. I knew who I sent out into the cold that night. And that was not acceptable. So I called a bunch of churches, and we all got together. And we created a homeless shelter that went from church to church. A lot more beds for people. What a blessing. What a witness. What we could do together. But where is it on the scale that I was just talking about? It's still giving a fish. We were just doing four. We weren't making any permanent difference in people's lives. So then we got people together. We got, and we got the people who are being served, because that's part of the key difference between direct service and the rest of what we can do, is that people become active agents in the process of changing their lives and their community. right? They become maybe, if not even angels, at least fully human. So we got people together, and we said, well, what more can we do? And so we ended up raising the funds to buy up about ha half of a block of housing in an area that was really distressed. And we rehabbed it with some expertise from the churches and some sweat equity from the folks. And by the end of about nine, 10 months, we had affordable housing for 40 people. Boy, was that a witness. It actually lifted up the whole community to see this fresh new housing there, right? It was community development, not just individual development. It was all, above, all of the above. But we were sitting there celebrating, and I had this inconvenient little voice in my head. I think part of what it means to be um, part of Luther's family is that it's very hard. Luther had the um, sometimes fatal incapacity to lie to himself. <laughs> and a lot of us share that <laughs> as Lutherans proudly. Um, so I had this little voice in my head saying, how many people are on the street tonight? Well, 10,000. We're helping 40. So we began to say to ourselves, well, what did this experiment, what we could just do by ourselves, have to say, have to teach the larger policy picture? That's when you begin to say, how big is the lordship of our God? And what can we do? to utilize everything in our hands to change our communities. Um, I don't have time to do all of these things. <laughs> I haven't done a 30 minute in a while. <laughs> it's like, ooh, what can we do in 30 minutes? Uh, just a couple more quick things I want to give you. Um, one is, well, I do want to say one thing to you back from here, which is um, when I begin to talk on this level, some of you may have the reaction that a young man had when I was the scholar in residence at a college in rural Iowa. Um, I did all of this, and he raised his hand, and he said, Pastor, I need to tell you that everything you're saying feels like a burden. He said, it's hard enough to be a student and a Christian, and then I have to love my neighbor, and then it's not even enough to give them a fish. I have to teach them to fish. He said, and now you want me to look at systems and policies? He said, it just feels like a burden. And what struck me at that moment is that privilege in our world is being able to choose your burdens. You know, if you're born in this country, you never have to deal with the hell that our brothers and sisters are going through in El Salvador. If you're born in a family that has the resources to get you health care, to get you a good education, you never have to deal with our broken public education and public health care systems. But while some of us can choose our burdens, others of us are crushed under the burden of systems that are not effective or fair or logical. And then we need to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. But one of the reasons why it feels like such a burden is that we have a body with lots of sleeping parts. So we have to awaken all the parts of our body in order to do the full range of what God has given us joyfully to be able to do to transform our communities in his name and spirit. And the very last thing I just want to say to you is I want you to really recognize that our leaders, whether they're our political leaders or our corporate leaders, are part of the body. And that is, of course, absolutely true if they are believers. So how are we ministering to our leaders? so that they exercise their function in the body. 
So that's just what I want to leave you with. What does it mean to pray for your leaders? Um, when you love somebody who's sick, how often do you pray for them? Constantly, right? How often do you pray fervently for your leaders? Well, <laughs> right, right now maybe we're praying a little more, thanks be to God. <laughs> the bright side of the cloud. <laughs> but they also need our encouragement. They need discipling. They need support. One politician said to me, everybody else who came in here today wanted something from me. You were the only people who wanted something for me. You wanted me to obey God. And there is no greater blessing. So if we're not there, nobody else will be there. So it is a great gift to be able to respond to that which breaks our hearts with love and power. But we have to understand that that, in fact, is part of our call. And we have to be willing to be fearless in examining the full range of gifts that we've been given and how to use them in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ. Thank you.